People Keeping It Sacred, our new program highlighting people keeping it sacred in the world. I'm Rabbi Heather Miller, founder of Keeping It Sacred, and I'm so excited to introduce you to today's guest, Ravanit Alyssa Thomas Newborn. Ravanit Alyssa is a member of the spiritual leadership at B'nai David Judea Congregation, an Orthodox shul. She received her smicha from Yeshivat Maharat and graduated magna cum laude from Brandeis University with a degree in Near Eastern and Judaic Studies and Classical Studies, Archaeology and Ancient History. Ravanit Alisa is also a board certified chaplain through Neshama, an association of Jewish chaplains, that's NAJC. And she is currently a per diem chaplain for Grateful Palliative Care and Hospice. A native Angelino, Ravanit Alisa is married to Akiva Newborn. They have a baby girl, Ella Leora, and a snuggly dog named Judy. We became great friends during the Jewish Leadership Fellowship with the Jewish Federation of Los Angeles. I'm so excited to have you here. We found out that we have a lot in common and I'm honored to be your friend. Welcome, Alyssa. Feeling is mutual. Thanks so much for having me. I'd love to ask you about your spiritual journey, how you grew up and where you, what drew you to what I can plainly see as your calling to be a spiritual leader of our people. I, uh, you know, I think similar to you, one of the things that I, I love about you and also that I really connect with you as a colleague in is I think that we're both, like we're both really in this for Hashem, like we're in this for God. This is all about how we can bring more godliness, sacredness, more holiness into ourselves and into the world. And um, for me, really since the time I was, really 15, I felt this calling to, to serve God and, and his people and our world in a way that was a spiritual path. Um, when I was 15, I had uh, several deaths in our community and a lot of sickness. Um, and I found myself, you know, either at funerals or in hospitals. And it, you know, so you mentioned the darkness and the light. Uh, I found myself in a lot of darkness. And at the time, um, I watched the, the rabbis around me handle it, whether it was through um, providing spiritual pastoral care or officiating at funerals. And I just felt like I want to be, I feel this calling to be with people in those moments of darkness and to, to be a source of support and comfort and presence. Um, so I, I felt that then when I was 15 and uh, how that then evolved into uh, going to Yeshivat Maharad and working in an Orthodox shul uh, changed over time. I actually grew up in uh, the reform movement and my mom is a rabbi in Cantor, um, but she raised us with halachic observance that was very close to orthodoxy. So, you know, the way in which I learned Torah and thought about Torah and um, really even in the language in which I talked about, about God was, uh, you know, to, at the time for me is very unique to being connected to my mom because I had grown up in her community. But when I went to college, I found that where I felt most at home was actually in the Orthodox community. So I had to figure out, you know, what was I going to do with this calling that I felt aligned me with what I was supposed to do for Hashem in this world. Um, and, and also the fact that in the Orthodox community that, you know, the sort of rabbinic role wasn't something that was uh, as common for women. So I was very blessed that Yeshivat Maharat uh, came into existence at that time in my life. And I was one of the first graduates. Um, and, you know, it's been, I feel incredibly blessed that I'm able to, to live in the spiritual community that is right for me. And everyone has, you know, the place in the home that they feel most connected to. Um, and also to be really, to feel like I'm doing the best that I can each day to try to fulfill that calling that God gave me. Um, so it's a, I think it's something you can definitely relate to. And I'd actually love to hear your reflections on that too, because it's, it's, you know, you have the moments where you struggle and you don't know the path ahead, but having that amuna, having that faith and really trying to make sure that we're in alignment with God's voice and ourselves, I think is, and, and that genuinely the purpose is about God's voice, not any sort of ego or drama. Um, that to me has, has been the driving force. How can I best serve God in this life? And that's why we get along so well. It's just this idea <laughs> of, you know, I think we both, you know, and I'll speak for myself specifically, but I, I really find such depth and meaning and purpose in the text. And it's so enriched my life. And it has ever since I came to my formal study um, in 92, in 1992 is when I started formally studying, when I went to a Jewish day school 
And I found, you know, we started with Mishnah and started with Bava Kama, Bava Mitzia, and tort law. And you wouldn't believe that tort law would affect a teenager that much. But the <laughs> idea that, you know, that we're all responsible for one another. No, Rabbi Leah Kroll, who taught that class at, at Milken, which was then called Stephen Weiss, you know, we learned about the laws of lost and found. And, mm. you know, that if you find something, what is your responsibility to try and return it to the owner and the rabbinic debates and the arguments and what if it was money and money is not traceable and then but what if it was stacked and it was but what if it was in the public thoroughfare versus not and I just I love that conversation to think about like what's the best way that we can engage in community and be in community and be responsible to one another and be responsible for one another and engage in that way and that just really opened up my eyes to how how deep and how thoughtful of, and rich a tradition that we have is and and to think about studying that and continuing to study that for now uh, 28 years it's been studying um, <laughs> study you know rabbinic law and rabbinic text and thinking about how to build community and then all the things the rabbis say about social justice and all the things they say about caring for people and I I also I think we get along so well because we you know, you just want to share that kind of, you know, Absolutely. beauty that, you know, that framework, that lens to life that you can have to, you know, to, to bring that gift. Like, I feel like it's such a gift. You always say Natan Torah, right? It's, like, it's a gift. Torah is a gift, but um, to be able to, to, to share that is, is a privilege and an honor. I totally agree. And I, you're making me think of, uh, there's a, there's a famous text in the Gemara about, it's, you know, like one of those moments of ownership. And, you know, if you find a, an item or you find a, you know, a Talid, like in it, you're trying to figure out who owns it. And um, just one of those like very talkless about the logistics of a situation. Um, and Ish Kodesh, who's the Warsaw Ghetto Rebbe, uh, he talks about how, you know, that in and of itself is like a moment like that in Torah is where you see, God. Like that's where you see divinity and light and holiness. And for me, um, you know, just the H. Kodesh speaks so much about how we, the Torah is written in a way that we can each receive and connect to. And um, that also means that it has to be taught to us in a way that's accessible and that we can receive. Um, but opening up our hearts, like we see ourselves in it. And that's, it's like the God in us responding to the godliness of the Torah. And one of the things that I love about the sacred work that you're doing is you're taking texts that for a lot of, a lot of people on the surface can feel um, mundane or, you know, one of those, you, sometimes you learn a text and you're like, but wait, what? Like, why, why should I care? Like, why am I learning this? Or if I lift my head up, from the book, like the world is around me. How does this relate to my life? But you very much so are committed to taking text just like that and making it, making each text applicable. Because the truth is that everything is in the Torah. Everything is in the, you know, the oral tradition. There's, there's so much wisdom that's timeless, but sometimes you have to mine for it. Uh, and I, I think you're, you're an amazing miner of that wisdom. Thank you. And it's, you know, the conversation that just keeps going and the fact that we can plug in and add to, you know, our understanding of how it relates in today's time. I think that that's, that's the gift. That's the opportunity for all of us to be able to, to jump in to that conversation. Right. And find our voice in it. And, and I think, you know, one of the one of the interesting directions that conversation can go is, is obviously when we, when we see differences in what those voices are um, and, and how, we, how we still remain in the same conversation, especially when we start to go in different directions. That's a perfect segue because the next question that I did want to ask is a little bit about Orthodox Judaism and what you think the biggest misconception of Orthodox Judaism or modern Orthodox Judaism is or any other branch. Um, I know that you've, you've spent time in, in many branches. And first, if you'd like to share a little bit about the difference between modern Orthodox Judaism and Orthodox Judaism, but then, you know, what, what are some of the biggest misconceptions? I'd love to help our viewers kind of clear that up a little bit. Yeah, no, that's a, a great question. Um, what I would say is, I so I, I would identify as modern Orthodox or as Orthodox. Um, traditionally sort of the understanding of what we mean by modern orthodox is you know essentially being part of the modern world and also being orthodox having this sort of this this rootedness in the tradition while balancing the fact that you know we of course value and embrace secular skills you know 
working as lawyers, doctors, and recognizing science, you know, a, a, um, a full embracing of this, the secular world, and also uh, balancing that with, you know, a, a, a complete commitment to Orthodox halacha, Orthodox Jewish law. Um, and yeah, I would say that, you know, for me, Orthodox, non-Orthodox, it's like sort of the same thing like the the words um are, are pretty much the same because they that's what it means to me um i think that you know at this point in in orthodoxy there's a lot of different branches even within it um and that's true of you know when you when you look at um in the, the more right wing you get with different rabbeim, different rabbis that people are following, and um, you know, not, not only Sephardi and Ashkenazi, but also Chabad versus you know Haredi and Hasidic, d- different branches, Satmar. Um, I think that that today in modern America, there's a, there's sort of orthodoxy that's more um, liberal and progressive, and there's also orthodoxy that's more sort of um, like small C conservative. Um, we see, you know, Orthodox Jews who are uh, focused on um, a lot of, you'll see like social justice issues and different things in the more progressive circles. And you'll see, um, you know, less of a focus on that in other circles. And I, I think, I think maybe one of the biggest, if you're going to ask about a misconception, it might be just that like Orthodox Jews are all the same. Um, because there's just so much diversity in Orthodoxy to the point that, you know, very often we end up doing like unity programs with Orthodox shuls that are very, very different. Um, so I, I guess, you know, each, just as, as would be the case in, in conservative reform, reconstructionist renewal, the different movements, um, et cetera, that you would find them looking different based on the shul or the synagogue temple. Um, the same would, would be true in, in orthodoxy. So for those who are sort of less invested in that world, um, I would just say there's, you know, often like a misconception that all Orthodox Jews thinks X, think X and, you know, disagree with Y and, um, and there's a lot more diversity going on there. That's so illuminating. I think that's really important for people to understand and to never, you know, judge someone on face value of any one aspect of their identity or upbringing or anything, any, their profession, any part of who they are. It's just to really welcome in that multidimensional human being that's in front of you and to kind of understand a, a bit deeper. Yeah. It's definitely true. And I, I guess maybe the thing that the flip side of that is like what unites all of orthodoxy is orthodoxy would, would be um, primarily observance of kashrut, of kosher law, observance of, uh, of Shabbos, Hilchot Shabbos, and then observance of which is family purity laws. So those are really, you know, within the Orthodox community, this sort of expectation or practice is that everyone is keeping, uh, you know, Shemar Shabbos, Shemar Kashrut, and then being a part of those who are married, anyone who is married having that observance as well. So I, I think that, you know, the, the unity is sort of on that observance level. Um, you know, I think of to go in an interesting direction. I think of like someone who's converting to Judaism, um, you know, part of the commitment that's made um, by a convert when they're in that process is, you know, accepting Torah in its fullness, which means taking on all of the mitzvot, all of the commandments, um, and also taking on full belief in Torah, uh, you know, as given by God and all that comes with that. But I, I think it's an interesting point to think about, you know, in understanding each denomination, uh, if if that's of interest, sometimes that's an interesting place to start. Yeah, that's really that's really wonderful because whenever I sit on a Beit Din, you know, we talk a lot about so how, what does commandedness mean to you? What does moral obligation mean to you when you take on these 613 commandments on your shoulders? Right now, you can wear a talit as someone who's converted to Jesus and pr- provided you're over 13 years old, Um, you know, the idea of, you know, when you take on that responsibility on your shoulders, what are you feeling like you take on? Because the answer is not as clear in the reform movement, certainly, and and all liberal movements of just, um, you know, what is the meaning of halakha? What do you feel obligated to do? What are the commandments that are, you know, central to who, what your Jewish identity is now going to be or is that we're naming today? Um, so that's always a fascinating question that I love to, to ask because uh, the answers are so varied and you really get a sense of who a person is, right? When you ask them, what's your central commandment? You mm-hmm. really get to know who a person is by that answer. I'd love to talk more about your 
your spiritual leadership. Um, as a spiritual leader of B'nai David Judea, you know, I've known you to really be able to adapt in these times of COVID. I've seen so many of your Facebook videos and, you know, live streams, teaching Torah, teaching Talmud over the internet. Um, and I think that you're someone with such a, a warm hearted approach and such a caring approach to your congregants. I just wanted to see if you might be able to share a little bit about your approach as a spiritual leader and maybe some of the things that you've found that your congregants are or other people are needing in this world uh, during this global pandemic? You know, I think we've all had to adjust how we, certainly those of us who are working as clergy, how we teach Torah, even outside of the Jewish community, like how, how, how are religious leaders addressing what it is that they're teaching? How do they communicate in an effective way? So definitely when it comes to, you know, logistics and learning how to transition to that, uh, to like this online platform and, you know, especially as Orthodox Jews who are not using electricity on Shabbos, you know, it, it's, it's a, it's been a, a very um, experimental, interesting struggle filled experience and trying to find what's going to be, what's going to be best for, for our community. You know, we we're feeling very, very disconnected from each other right now from, from each other also from ourselves in terms of our purpose and what, you know, how we get through this. And it's a source of a lot of anxiety and depression for many of us. Um, and we're also feeling very disconnected from God, you know, feeling, you know, Hashem's guidance and, and healing and presence. I think it's, it's a, it's a very tough time. Uh, and we're also living with a great amount of, you know, not to use like a buzzword, but privilege just in the fact that we live in the 21st century and we have access to, you know, in, in America, we have access to heating and lights and water, you know, we're, we're, you know, if we're going to be at home, we're in, a, most of us are, um, in our community are pretty, pretty grateful that we have what we have. And at the same time, to still feel the anxiety and the depression and the fear and the worry, um, to live with the level of uncertainty that we're living with now uh, has made it, has made it a tremendous obstacle for many of us. Joining our, our members in processing this experience in a live way uh, has been a really big part of my day to day. So, you know, we have, we have different support groups uh, within our community that I run in terms of, you know, some mental health resources. Uh, there's also this group of, uh, of people who meet every week of different ages coming together uh, just to, to check in with each other on a weekly basis as we go through this. You know, a lot of the work has certainly been pastoral and halakhic and focusing on adapting to the holiday changes. Um, but I, I, I do think that, you know, when it really comes down to it, what makes this time different than regular times, whatever that is, uh, <laughs> You know, it is just on the day-to-day -day basis processing what it is that we're living, the significance of it, different feelings of guilt around it, um, how we can help each other, uh, and the emotional roller coaster that we've all been on. I'm sure you can relate as well. You know, some days are really great, some days are much harder, and um, and when we're a community, we try to go through those things together. Also, now those regular moments are over Zoom as well, which yeah. actually I think. Even though we can't meet in person now, I think I've, I know I've been speaking with a lot more people from a lot of different places. I mean, I'm, con you know, weekly on the phone with, I have people in the Keeping It Sacred community in England and Texas, you know, all of these places where it would have been impossible for us to meet weekly in a room. And now, you know, so I think that the, the profane or regular days have become more sacred in some way, also more, more scary, but more, you know, more potential there. The holy days during COVID, you know, it's been a lot harder because you are used to, I mean, for many of the congregations that I've served for the closing song, you put your arms around each other, you know, you are staring at each other's eyes when you're all looking at the Havdalah candle and, you know, looking at each other's eyes and looking at the reflection of God in your fingernails and in their eyes. And, you know, there's, there's that intimacy, that, that connection of, breathing the same air, being in the same space um, that feels really different online. Um, and I think that, you know, for, for me, when I'm thinking about the high holiday services, thinking about pivoting 
and how to maybe use technology in ways that we hadn't done before that could maybe enhance the service. Like, yeah, I just, I think, you know, the tools have changed, right? We used to have a building to connect and now we've got the internet to connect and it's up to us to use the tools for good and to innovate in ways that can kind of keep that e-car, that essence of our tradition going. And so identifying what that is and then bringing that through the technology, understanding the technology well enough to bring that together is I think the challenge, but it's also very exciting to be a spiritual leader at this time. And anyone, you know, that, that we have that opportunity to think about how to make these tools work for us. Right, and I think going back to our denominations conversation, that looks different in each denomination too. Uh, and that's, you know, it's something I think we can connect on and be creative about and also, you know, be unique in as well. So how, how are you doing Shabbat services then? I actually, I haven't, I haven't talked with you about this yet. Yeah, um, so how, how, how Benny David is doing it is, you know, you know, we're Orthodox, so we're not using any electricity, we're not using Zoom, we're not uh, live streaming anything. Uh, when it's Shabbat or when it's Chag, when it's Yom Tov. Um, so our, our weekday davening, our weekday services, so Shachri and Mincha and Mariv, every day are, uh, are live streamed from Zoom. So uh, a, a minion meets in person in a backyard locally, uh, and that minion of 10 men um, is meeting, you know, it, we, we have in each backyard that it's, that it's happening in, there's you know, enough for, for, there's enough space for men and women to both attend um, and to have more than, than 10 men. Um, but the, the minion itself is happening. And then we have a computer there uh, where we live stream that so that those who are not able to leave their homes can watch and be a part of it and join, respond to Kaddish. Um, and we have Divrei Torah each time from me and from Rav Yosef, uh, and that's during the weekday, so Sunday through Friday morning. Um, then on Shabbat, we have uh, several uh, backyard minyanim as well, so several services that are happening also in backyards, because at this point, you know, I don't know at what point in the future people are going to be watching this, but currently we are not uh, able to be in our building. So we're allowed in Los Angeles to have outdoor uh, worship services, um, you know, under a certain capacity uh, and following all of the guidance, guidelines, social distancing, masks, temperature taking, everything. Um, so what we're doing is on Shabbat, we have those services. People can register in advance. Uh, they show up and, um, you know, they they participate under all of the regulations. Uh, and it's it's really meaningful for for those who are able to attend to have that opportunity to still do something in person. So, you know, what a lot of people do is, is praying at home with their kids, um, you know, printing out resources beforehand so they can read words of Torah that have been written or, you know, reading books together. Um, and, and Shabbat itself, you know, you have Shabbat dinner, uh, which doesn't require you be at shul. Um, Shabbat lunch, same thing, you know, sud uh, it, it, It's there's still so much to the day, um, ritually, especially for families that are focused around it, you know, a home dining room table. Um, I think what's, what's been a real, uh, what's been a real obstacle is, is how for those who are living alone during this time and are not able to go in person to the services, um, that, that Shabbat and Yom Tov, when you turn off technology can be one of the most isolating times. Uh, so there, you know, for, for many people in the community, it's really been positive. They get to be home with their kids. They get to, uh, you know, turn off completely and they miss shul and they miss having Shabbat meals with other members of the community, which, you know, we all miss. It was such a nice thing to connect. Even before COVID started, you were having these mental health, you know, min group meetings, right? And you were doing all of these, you were being caring, compassionate about mental health and about the feelings of isolation that people experience even before COVID. So to think about how you who are already expert in that before can understand and share with us, you know, exactly how that continues through COVID and, and what kinds of things we can do as community members um, to pivot and address those, uh, those feelings for people, I think is, is really illuminating and um, and it's important for all of us to, to think about those people who are in our lives, who, you know, if we're, whether we're a member of a congregation or not, just those people who are in our lives who are alone to just remember to check up on people a bit more. And if we're alone to not hesitate to reach out to people 
um, right. as well. There is a, a text uh, about how, you know, references that, that Moshe was supposed to make the Luchot and then make the Ark to put them in. Uh, and it's a different Ark than the one that we're familiar with, but uh, it's, and that's a different conversation, but the, uh, the text references the Luchot first. It references the tablets being made first and then the, the Ark that they go into. Uh, and, and Rashi comments that Moshe actually said, so the order is that the Luchot are more important than the Ark, than the vessel, but I have, if, I, if I make the Luchot first, if I make the tablets first, I'm not going to have anywhere to put them. So I need to make the our own. I need to make the Ark first, and then I'll put the, the tablets inside. Um, and I, I think it's just a, an acknowledgement that, you know, we have the spiritual and the physical. We have to take care of both. They work in partnership. You know, without our bodies, we couldn't be existing as souls in this world. Um, and we have to take care of them. They're a gift from God. Uh, and at the same time, you know, we, we need, we can't just be an empty ark, you know, we need to feel, um, fulfilled and, and connected and, uh, a part of something bigger. So it's, it's sort of, I think, balancing how we take care of our ark, our physical, and also balancing how we take care of what goes inside of it, making sure that we're not stuck in a situation where we have an empty ark or where we have tablets with nowhere to put them. It makes me think about the Heschel idea about the the body without a soul or a soul without a body with regard to Keva and Kavana, right? You have Keva, you have the words of the prayers, but then you have the Kavana, your intention, your spirit, the spirit that you put into the prayers. And if you just have the spirit, you're just on top of a mountain praying to God, but there's no community ability to kind of join in with you and elevate what you're doing. But if you just have the words on the page and you're just reading them, you have no spirit in it, then it's just a body without a soul. You're just kind of, you know, being a robot, just saying, amen, amen. You know, you're not really putting into it what you can. So you need to have that body with the soul that way too. So it is. Judaism is so much about balance. What is keeping you strong at this time? What are you hopeful about? Hmm. I think my, my relationships with people, my, uh, my family, certainly my husband, my daughter, my family, my parents, um, definitely give me chizuk, give me strength to keep going. Um, the self-care, trying to find ways to, to make sure, you know, my own mental health is taken care of, my own physical health is taken care of. Um, that's, you know, that's become a harder thing for a lot of us. So um, that's that's been a point of, of chizuk for me too. Um, my relationship with God, I, uh, one of the things I've noticed is that I, you know, the rituals that are certainly still a part of my daily life uh, look a little bit different. So it's, it's very easy to get disconnected from them. Um, you know, for example, if you're used to going to prayer services in person and then suddenly you're not, or you're participating virtually, um, you know, the, the way in which we pray takes on a different tone. It could be more disconnected or more connected. Uh, it depends on the person. But I think for me, checking back in in my relationship with Hashem has, has always been very important, but um, is certainly at the core of where I'm at now. I, I do feel like God is with me and supporting me and any obstacles that I can remove, um, Baruch Hashem have, have gotten easier. Um, sort of the things that are in my control in my own life. Um, and when there's been obstacles that are harder to remove, uh, I feel like I've had a good amount of support. Um, so I just, I feel very blessed and fortunate uh, in that way. My work is certainly a source of inspiration and strength to be able to support people and have a purpose in my daily life is so essential. So I'm very, very grateful for that. You know, I have, I have a daughter who's one year old, Ella, and seeing her grow and change every day has been exhausting and it's also been really such such a miracle uh, i think the fact that we we've gotten to spend so much time with her at home uh and just my husband and i are both here like we're both able to to see different stages in her growth it's really a huge gift 
Uh, she's so happy. She's so excited and engaged with the world around her and life. And um, and that that I think is a, a very important reminder. Uh, I know that there's been, you know, several people have asked me to send pictures of her and I'm like, you know, I don't want to overwhelm people with, with pictures, but, uh, but I, I do, you know, I am getting the sense that people are yearning for that sort of reminder of life and newness and something to look forward to and hope. Uh, and she's certainly a source of that for me. Um, but I feel very grateful that, that, you know, I, I am, I'm able to serve in this way at this time. Um, and I do have hope that, you know, this is something that will, will end and will really the, the question of like, who do we want to be after this fuels me as well, because there will be a time when we're not dealing with these issues, but we'll still be the same people. And how do we, how do we want to come through? This is a huge part of that for me. That's a great question. Who do we want to be when we come out of this? I, I think that that's something we all need to answer for ourselves. And I think that that's, that is very motivating. I, I think that we as adults forget that we're also, we also have that potential to grow and to keep growing. And especially with your Hebrew language studies, everyone. <laughs> we can, right, learn we can always learn things. more. <laughs> but you know, with Torah, right? Yeah, I've never felt closer to Talmud study every single day for the past 200 plus days with the Dafyomi cycle, um, intentional Talmud study every single day. Um, I would add about the like the sources of strength. Cause I think when we see other people do really beautiful, meaningful, sacred things, it inspires us. And I, you know, I'm very grateful that that's something I see in my community members and Benny David people and in, uh, in you, you know, when, when people do, when you see the light come out, um, it's so, it's so inspiring and beautiful. Um, I'll, I'll mention one congregant in particular, her name is Cindy Kaplan. Cindy Abrookin is her, her new name. She got married relatively recently. Um, she, she taught uh, a really beautiful interpretation of a text uh, that's familiar. It's Zehayom Asa Hashem, Nagila Venis Mechabo, from Tehillim, that we, this is the day that God has made. Let us be happy. Let us rejoice in it. And it's normally, you know, we think about it in Hallel or a moment of a real joy and excitement. Uh, and sometimes, when we say those words, it might be a little bit hard to internalize that joy and excitement. You know, what if we're coming, what if it's not a good day and we come in and we're like, what is it, you know, how can I say this is the day that God's made? I'm so thrilled. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of the interpretations that she gave that I, I really learned from and love um, is that we, to read it as Zahayom Asayashem, like this is the day that God made. It is, may not be perfect, but this is the day that I'm living and I need to be grateful that there is a day and I want to find joy. I'm going to commit Nagila Benis Mechabo. I'm going to find a way uh, to connect to the joy within it without sort of denying wherever I'm at. Uh, and I found that interpretation to be really inspiring and we have the opportunity to learn from each other right now. And I, you know, I certainly learned from her. Um, and, but we have the, the chance to learn from each other. Uh, and I am very grateful to spend time talking to you and learning from you. And I, I pray that, you know, we, we be people who don't deny the struggle that's there because we, we have, that's really what makes us moral people who are focused on justice and trying to make God's world better and better uh, in the way that God intends it to be. Um, and that we also, you know, in recognizing the imperfections and the need for growth that we also have the commitment to look for the goodness in each other, to look for the joy and to cultivate that in our hearts and in our world, because we're really very much in need of it right now. And it's an, a remarkable calling for each of us to have to be a partner with God in that. A wholehearted amen to that, all of that. It's really well said and, and beautiful and, and I couldn't agree with you more. Where can we find you? What projects do you want our audience to know about? Well, you are welcome to go to B'nai David's website, B'nai David Judea in Los Angeles, and my Parsha classes are on there, the source sheets that I make. I also, as you mentioned before, I'm doing little five-minute words of Torah on Facebook, so you're welcome to go to my Facebook page, Alyssa Thomas Newborn, uh, and anything that B'nai David does on Facebook, there's, uh, I'm usually involved to some degree. So uh, I'm very happy to, to connect with you there. Uh, and also you can feel free to email me. My email is athomas, T-H-O-M-A-S, 1818 at gmail.com. That's my personal email. You are welcome to contact me there too. Uh, but really just go through Rabbi Heather. 
Well, <laughs> thank you so much for sharing so much of your spirit and the joy that you have, even in these these darker times, you know, to really be able to bring out the light and to share the, the highlights as well and, and to remind us all of the highlights that, that are among us at all times. And thank you to our audience also for tuning in. If you have someone you'd like to recommend that we host on the show, please contact us at rabbiheathermiller.com. There you can also sign up for our newsletter to stay up to date with all that we're programming, opportunities to study together, and more. Thanks, everyone.